trading for development in the age of global value chains. So I'm here with two of the directors of the report, Caroline Freund and Adit Yamatu, uh, to discuss the findings of the report. Uh, so let me start with a very basic question. The report is on trade, as I said, but specifically on global value chains. So Caroline, could you please explain for your audience in, in non-technical terms, what are global value chains and why has the World Bank decided to focus on global value chains this year? So global value chains um, describe trade that crosses borders more than once. So it might be raw material that is exported and goes to another country, gets processed in some way into another part and component, maybe it crosses another border and gets put into a final good, and then finally goes somewhere for consumption. So all this is happening and trade is continuing through each border. Um, and what's really interesting is this increased a lot, this type of trade, uh, from about 1990 to the <coughs> mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, it, there was just this boom in trade that helped countries to grow. And there are two things about global value chains that are really special. One is hyper-specialization. So countries don't need to produce a whole good, mm -hmm. they just produce one part of a good. And that enables them to be, be trade more because they can take advantage of their comparative advantage in producing this uh, part or component at scale. And the second feature that's interesting is firm to firm relationships. So because there tends to be a lead firm involved in these global value chains, and that firm may have special knowledge or technology, and it transfers that to the suppliers. So there tend to be more gains from technology transfer, learning by doing, and so forth. So global value chains help countries to trade, and in some ways make it easier because of this hyper-specialization and in addition to that, there's this tech, technological transfer part of it that is good for countries. Mm -hmm. So from what you said, this is a, a special kind, a specific mm -hmm. kind of trade. Um, what do you find in the report? So our, our ultimate objective in the World Bank is to reduce poverty. So do the global value chains, does trade through global value chains contribute to reductions in poverty, to growth? What, what are the report's findings? I think um. one of the most compelling pieces of evidence in the report is how much participation in global value chains contributes to growth. I think as Caroline described, first of all, because you break up these complex products like cars and computers into similar parts, it's easier in principle for countries to break in. Secondly, this hyper-specialization is like Adam Smith on steroids. You know, you, you know, this ballpoint pen, for example, this point is made in Japan, the clip is made in Malaysia, and the body in China. So the scope, as Caroline very nicely said, for specialization, increasing returns to scale, and then flows of technology, capital, and inputs, that really boosts productivity. We found, for example, in Ethiopia, that firms that are participating in global value chains are twice as productive as those that aren't really uh, doing similar trade. And, and countries that have successfully engaged might have grown up to a percentage point faster than other countries. And the biggest boost seems to come when you move from commodity or natural resource or agricultural production into manufacturing. And we saw that in Bangladesh, we've seen it in Cambodia and in Vietnam. So, so that's the first big boost, the growth boost. The employment story is a little bit more complicated because these global value chains, because the firms are more productive, they also tend to be more capital intensive. So that has created a legitimate worry about whether they're generating enough jobs. But the good news is the higher productivity, the larger scale means, again, in a country like Ethiopia, the firms that are in GVCs, employment is growing much faster than another. So when you take the higher productivity, the greater employment, that brings only good news for poverty reduction. 
We've looked across regions in Mexico and Vietnam that the regions where there is greater intensity of GVC participation have seen much sharper reductions in poverty. So that, that all sounds very positive. It sounds good news. Mm -hmm. um, oh, how about the effects on inequality? So uh, these days, in at least in advanced economies, there is a lot of concern that the gains from globalization have not been shared equally. Um, what does the report have to say about this question? Or is that something you are looking at? There's the rub, <laughs> as Hamlet <laughs> would say. I think you're absolutely right, Penny, that there is a concern that while we are getting all these benefits, the world is becoming a more unequal place. We have evidence, for example, which looks at markups, how much firms charge in terms of prices above costs. And these industrial country firms that are outsourcing to developing countries, their markups seem to be increasing, mm -hmm. which means they're not passing on the benefits fully to consumers. And developing country firms which are selling to these industrial country firms, their markups seem to be declining. We have a very interesting chart which looks at the garment industry in India and the United States where you have this contrasting picture. So that's the first problem. The first concern is this international inequality. Then within countries, the fact of outsourcing, for example, from industrial countries to countries with cheaper labor has certainly put pressure on the distribution between capital and labor. The share of capital is increasing, the share of labor is declining. Within the labor market, skill premiums are going up. And there's also a really interesting fact that while women have benefited enormously, like in Bangladesh, in the garment industry, they have really benefited in terms of employment, the glass ceiling that the both of you have broken out of, unfortunately persists in global value chain. So there are legitimate concerns about the world perhaps becoming richer, but more unequal. So, so, so since we're talking about concerns, let me raise another concern that you sometimes hear. Uh, so the by local movement emphasizes that trade can have adverse effects on the environment. And this concern seems particularly pronounced in the, in the case of global value chains, because as Caroline point out, pointed out, the goods cross the border multiple times. So this sounds to me like a lot of transport, a lot of shipping, a lot of packaging. Um, does the report look at this question? Yes, we do. We delve into the effects on the environment. And actually, they go both ways. So first, if you just think about trade in general, mm -hmm. um, Trade enables countries to take advantage of their abundant resources and import scarce resources from abroad. So if you think of an arid country that if it didn't trade, it would have to produce its own food, um, mm -hmm. it's much better to import it and save those very scarce resources. So there's this first general effect of trade, and in GVCs it's even more pronounced, uh, that enables countries to take, to, to save their scarce resources, which is good for the environment. On the other hand, you do have this back and forth shipping, mm -hmm. and that's of concern to some, especially because shipping fuels tend to be exceptionally polluting. Mm -hmm. And also, we hear often about the plastic wastes in the ocean and so forth. And really, 20% of that comes from, ship, from the shipping industry itself. So there's this aspect of it, as well as the packaging on the materials that need to be shipped back and forth that tends to be bad for the environment. Um, Hyper-specialization can also result in some, in some damage if you're using a resource too in intensively. Um, what we come out thinking about this really is it's very important to price uh, things right. So whether it's shipping fuel, um, in terms of production, it's important not to subsidize, mm -hmm. because if you subsidize different parts, you'll tend to overuse. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first important rule is really to get prices right, to take into account not just the economic cost, but also the social or environmental costs. Regulations can also help. Mm -hmm. um, so to regulate some of the more damaging 
uh, whether it's pollution or, or other effects. Finally, you know, one of the things people worry most about with respect to the environment has been this sort of pollution haven hypothesis that um, production will move to parts of the world where they regulate the least. Fortunately, that has not turned out to be the case. Comparative advantage is very important um, and tends to rule where things move much more than this one small aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so let me ask you a somewhat different question. You know, um, so far we refer to the past, to the historical experience with global value chains. But, but looking into the future, one concern many people have expressed is that new technologies and automation in particular may limit the scope of specialization and developing countries may not have, may, may have lost the ability to participate uh, in trade and, and use trade as a path to develop. Um, do you have anything to say about this uh, in the report? Uh, of course, I understand it's very hard to look into the future. No one has yeah. a crystal ball. But, but do you have any insights into how technology may affect uh, global value chains? Well, we can do that looking at the history. So um, while we don't have a crystal ball, uh, wish we did, um, what we can do is say, okay, what industries have automated the most and how has that affected trade? And actually what we find is that the industries that have automated the most, such as autos, are also the industries that use global value chains most intensively. Okay. Um, uh, how do you explain that? This seems very counterintuitive. What, what is the intuition? Well, when you automate, productivity rises. Mm -hmm. And um, this means that either the quality of the good is much better or the price has fallen, so there's more demand. Uh, scale goes up, and as a result of this rising scale, you also need more of these goods that the automation only helps part of production. It doesn't help the whole thing. So, for example, in the auto industry, um, automation is done in the first stage of printing out the big parts. But it's not done in the assembly stage. Mm -hmm. That's still done by hand. There are certain parts that are still produced largely by people, and we need more of those parts, mm -hmm. and those tend to be produced in other countries. So this effect of scale mm -hmm. tends to outweigh the labor-saving component and trade actually increases. So if you look across the goods from least automated to most automated, it's actually the most automated ones that are more intensive in GVC production. We also looked at 3D printing, and there are some goods that are already being 3D printed. And this, everybody thought 3D printers would come into the house and you know, mm -hmm. people be producing their own goods. It's much more complex than that. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that goods that are being 3D printed, again, you have this productivity saving, and again, they're traded more. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it, it seems overall uh, global value chains have beneficial effects on growth and poverty reduction. Uh, however, not all countries uh, seem to have participated or uh, so many people think of global value chains, chains as being prevalent in East Asia or Europe. We don't think of global value chains as being present in Africa or Latin America. Let me ask you, is that true? And if so, what, what really drives this pattern? Uh, what, is, what do you have to say about it? So I think it's absolutely true that when you look at the pattern, it's mostly concentrated in these three, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, and North America. Mm -hmm. And the question is why? So clearly, geography plays a role. But I think the main drivers have been at this stage, for example, openness. The, these are the parts of the world which are relatively open. They have reduced... Oh, yeah, to interrupt. So by geography, you mean being close to big markets? Exactly right. Being, I should uh, have said that, that these are, you know, whether it was close to 
in Southeast Asia to Japan and China, whether it is proximity to Western Europe, the large market for Eastern Europe, or whether it's close to the North American market for, Central, uh, for Mexico and Central America. I think that has played an important role, but it wasn't just that they were close. These parts of the world also enacted big openness initiatives. The European integration, for example, the NAFTA agreement, and the Southeast Asian countries have traditionally been really open. So, so in a way, these, in this world of global value chains where, you know, as Caroline described, goods go back and forth across borders, protection is really costly, it cascades. So eliminating those costs has really helped. The other big thing is connectivity. We've noticed that it's the parts of the world that are really well connected, both in terms of transport and communication, for example, which have implemented relatively seamless uh, liberalization of road, maritime and air transport, liberalized telecommunications. That has mattered. It's what Richard Baldwin has argued in his book, The Second Great Unbundling, that it's primarily the parts which uh, have been able to create this seamless connectivity that have benefited from this. Finally, just two other points. You know, endowments matter. You know, having in that first stage low-cost labor is a huge temptation for investors. Mm -hmm. And that's the quid pro quo. Foreign investment flows have really facilitated. They have been a powerful driver of global value chain participation. And most of these parts of the world have been relatively open. It's German investment in Polish car industry, and Japanese and Korean investment in uh, Vietnam, and American investment in Mexico that has really provided a powerful kick to this international fragmentation of production. Um, one takeaway from what you said is that ultimately policy matters, and, and the kind of policies you mentioned are primarily national policies. Uh, what's the role of international cooperation in this environment? So it seems to me if you have products crossing borders multiple times, we need governments across borders to cooperate. Uh, Am I right? Yeah, absolutely, Penny. You know, the international trading system, the rule-based system has created openness, mm -hmm. predictability, which has been a powerful stimulus for the formation of global value chains and has been enormously beneficial for developing countries. Mm -hmm. They have, as I mentioned, the conclusion of the Uruguay round, but there are also agreements like NAFTA, the accession of China and Vietnam to the World Trade Organization, the accession of the Eastern European countries to the European Union. I think all these international cooperative arrangements have been vital. And there is a real risk now that that whole fabric which has created low protection, predictable policies is under pressure now. Although, so, so that's a very good point that the multilateral system is under pressure right now. And there are some people who argue it's gone too far, but there are also other people who argue it, it hasn't gone far enough. And perhaps uh, liberalization or cooperation should also include other areas going beyond trade. Uh, what does the report have to say about this? Is, do you think international cooperation would be sufficient for global value chains or do we need to do more? I think, Penny, we need to... Uh, walk on two legs, as Mao would say. <laughs> First of all, we need, you know, to say that we've gone too far, I think in many traditional areas, we still haven't got far enough. You know, there are still high tariffs in developing countries in Africa, in South Asia, which I inhibit their own opportunities. Services is vital for connectivity. And again, services markets tend to be heavily protected. Even in Southeast Asia, it's a big irony. They benefited enormously from openness in goods, but continue to protect services. Then state-owned enterprises. There's no doubt that they distort markets. And also increasingly since the financial crisis, the World Trade Organization has been tracking a growth in traditional protection. So I think we shouldn't be complacent about the traditional areas, but you're absolutely right. I think one of the most interesting thing about global value chains is we need to look beyond trade 
to keep trade open and beneficial. For example, the distributional concerns, we talked about inequality, we need more cooperation and taxes and taxation so that states can mobilize the resources to help the losers, but also improve infrastructure to create the winners. We need to think about international cooperation on data flows, which are really at the, the lifeblood of this global value chains. And there are legitimate concerns about privacy. And there are initiatives to address it, but they are risk leaving developing countries out. And finally, even competition policy. I mentioned markups, unequal benefits. We need greater cooperation because in all these areas, production is globalized, regulation is national. And that mismatch needs to be remedied. So this is a very interesting point and I'm afraid we'll have to stop here because we are out of time. But I hope that our conversation gave everyone food for thought. Uh, I hope you will, look, you will go to our website and read more about the upcoming World Development Report.